Good morning, everyone. Um, the objective of this session is to bring together different perspectives, to collect views on rail freight and rail freight's business involving. Because change is happening. We have change in business model, we have new markets, and we have new technology. You also know that we have very ambitious policy goals for rail freight. As part of the Green Deal, we want to increase its modal share very substantially, shifting goods from road to rail and inland waterways. Now, that means that the shift to rail successor will have to focus on some of the remaining shortcomings, and we want rail freight to be quite central to the tasks of the future joint undertaking, together with automation and digitization, which, of course, also matter to rail freight. Now, in his intervention yesterday, my Director General, Henry Kololai, has mentioned few key elements that would characterize the future of rail freight. The first one was multimodality. Rail in general, but freight in particular, have this potential to play a key role as the backbone for transport system in a multimodal environment. And we want to make sure that these multimodal connections work really well with ports, with terminals, with inland waterways, and of course with road terminals as well. The second key ca characteristic is resilience. And here, Henrik said that rail freight is actually on a very good track, because as we were all suffering from the shutdown of the lockdown of COVID-19, rail freight has jumped in and rail freight has managed to secure that the supply chains kept functioning and goods were arriving in our supermarket shelves and in our factories. Now, rail freight is also the most international of all the seg segments. And that's why we think that the rail freight is a big ally and um, a very good candidate for testing the single European rail area, for bringing about that seamless transport by one operator and the one and the same train going and doing business everywhere in Europe. And I think in that context, the analogy, the comparison with the truck is extremely relevant. And so this session brings together different views. And my purpose of this session would be to come up with two or three priorities to be delivered as part of the master plan for the future joint undertaking. So I know we have a lot of competition because we have parallel sessions with very interesting speakers, but this is the challenge that I put to you. I have five panelists, three questions pre-prepared, and the rest coming hopefully from the audience and engaging in a real dialogue between the panelists. That's why, without further ado, let me welcome Clemens First, Rail Cargo Austria. Philippe de Carnet, Geodis. Maurits von Schreulenburg, Port of Rotterdam. Sergio Barbarino, Procter and Gamble. Christoph Klose, Siemens Mobility. And Norbert Kahl, Shift to Rail Freight Innovation Program Coordinator and DB Cargo. Very welcome, thank you very much. Now, I hope that we will have a very, very good connection uh, and that we will be able to engage in a real discussion with you. I have one first question that proved to be very popular, so I'm going to put it to all five of you. In your opinion, what are the causes that prevent rail freight in the EU from growing compared to other freight means? of transport. Clemens, would you like to make a start, please? Thank you very much. Also, thank you very much for the question because it, it really allows me to, 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 to present the three pillars uh, the sector believes are relevant to really move the needle on modal share, right? I mean, we have come together in 2018 to form the Rail Freight Forward Initiative. 
uh, because we, as a whole sector, uh, incumbents, new entrants, uh, uh, the big associations, we strongly believe um, that we need to work together to, to, to really um, achieve some change. And, and we have come together and we, 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 we formed this strategy, formulated the strategy. Um, it's called uh, 30 by 2030, so increase the model share to 30% in Europe by 2030. Um, and it's three pillars. So the first pillar is um, us as a sector doing our homework. Um, and that's something we are doing sort of um, along um, several dimensions. So it's smaller initiatives we are, we are working together on, such as reducing language barriers, simplifying break sheets and so on. Um, and there are bigger initiatives uh, which we now dared to start or to tackle um, since uh, since the Green Deal was announced, um, um, which which revolves very much about topics like the digital automatic coupling, like digital platforms, and so on and so forth. So, um, if you ask later about priorities uh, going forward, um, these would be mine at least. So it's it's us doing our homework as a sector, us doing our homework also as as our use um, working um, on better services, working on digitalization, working on customer centricity and so on, and innovation. So that's the first pillar. But I think that the most important thing next to us doing our job, um, for me, is really important to stress, even if we do a perfect job as a railway sector, right? I strongly believe that we don't really have a chance to significantly move the needle because we need two other prerequisites. The second one is a high-performing infrastructure. And just to put it simple, running a train through Europe should be easy as going by truck. So this addresses all topics like interoperability, um, infrastructure, um, capacity, and so on. And the third requirement we need, so the third pillar of the strategy is the fair economic boundary conditions. Simply put, in Austria, we have an EU notified subsidy scheme um, and, and we have a model share of 30%. Uh, in Europe, we typically don't have it yet, to that extent at least, uh, and we have a model share below 20%. So I think also the third pillar is extremely important to achieve um, um, a dramatic model shift. So that would be my answer, us doing our homework, having a high-performing infrastructure interoperable across Europe, because we're talking about international transport if we talk about rail freight mostly, uh, and the third one is fair economic boundary conditions. Thank you, Clement. I'd like to put the same question actually to Maurits Franz Hörlenberg, because for a port, infrastructure is of course also an essential element. How do you look at rail as being uh, interconnected with the services in the port? And what would it take for rail freight to outgrow other freight transport means? <coughs> Good morning. Well, the judge might have a bit of a call. Um, the Netherlands have a regular survey of forwarders and shippers who uh, make the choice which modality to use. And um, they said what are our main criteria. And on top of the list is the price. Mm -hmm. Second one is reliability. And then there's uh, speed and flexibility. And uh, almost at the end, there's sustainability. So there is also a mind shift needed with the, the shippers and forwarders. And what you see is uh, that, that it's, it's hard. And for real transportation, you, you need, talk about the container trains, some six, 700 kilometers. Um, and then the train can compete on costs, including the last mile costs. But uh, Clemens also said re reliability is, is very important. And maybe uh, you've read about uh, the reliability issues we have uh, at the Port of Rotterdam last uh, years, and that's, uh, that's very bad. If the infrastructure uh, has no alternatives and, uh, and there are lots of issues with uh, maintenance. So there's a lot to, to, to be done, but it's no doom and gloom. Uh, it certainly has a uh, huge potential on, on the long run. And the support of, of Rotterdam uh, being the biggest part of Europe, we uh, also see it as a very strategic uh, importance to invest in rail to optimize so the, the handling of the trains in, in our port. We invest quite a lot also in IT systems to, to uh, optimize uh, the whole handling and the interaction of trains and, uh, and terminals and infrastructure management. Hmm. Okay. 
Yes, thank you, Maurits. It's, I think you rightly mentioned that infrastructure is, of course, hard infrastructure, but also the IT. And I keep that in the back of my mind for when we come back to discussing what it means for, for shift to rail and for the future joint undertaking. Um, similar question uh, uh, to Philippe de Carnet from Geodis. How does that work for you? How do you look at the different parameters, infrastructure, price, flexibility, reliability, in terms of boosting rail freight? Because we need it to grow faster than other modes of transport if we want the model share to increase. Floor is yours. Sure. Welcome. Thank, thank you for asking. So I, as a preliminary statement, I would like to say that uh, we, Geodis, we are forwarders. We are three PLs. And uh, we are more in the business of transport organization than transporting the freight uh, with our means. So by essence, I'm not an enemy of, of rail. My mother company is SNCF, the French uh, uh, railway uh, company. And, and uh, we are operating ourselves a lot of trains. We are uh, outside of Europe or connecting to Europe. We are one of the main players between China and Europe and Europe to China. On, on rail, so I, I believe in, in the rail uh, in the rail solution, uh, generally speaking. But our business is uh, mainly to satisfy customer needs, and uh, uh, rail has probably competitive advantages in different industries and types of freight for the heavy and, and bulky. When you have to transport a big volume of undifferentiated cargo, and when time is not of the essence meaning that you have uh, at least the base of the demand that can be easily forecasted. Um, it can be a raw material for sure, but under certain conditions, uh, it can be also a package goods, a package uh, beverages, for instance. When it comes to uh, the rest of the freight, um, trucking is easier, faster, more agile in a vast majority of, of situations. And uh, speed and agility are of utmost importance in industries where just in time is the religion and uh, the demand is, uh, is fragmented. Uh, the causes I see uh, are, are different from countries to country, and this reflects in, in the rail market shares across Europe. And in France, you know that we have one of the lowest. So I, I will talk from the, the French uh, standpoint, our own uh, country. And this might be not relevant in all European uh, countries. What I see as the main, the main uh, blocks uh, limiting the use of, of rail is the uh, lack of trains first, uh, the low frequency. Uh, today, nobody will imagine other things to go through the channel to go to UK or coming from, from UK, either than using the, 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 the Eurostar trains, because you have a, a train basically every 10 minutes, and um, you, you, you don't have to book in advance, you can come and, and, uh, and, uh, and go on the train. The cut of time is often a, a limitation to uh, if you have uh, to cut off uh, the, uh, the loading of the train one or two hours before the actual departure of the train. It's, it's bringing more time in, in, uh, in, in the delivery uh, uh, cycle, and it's something that uh, can hinder also the use of, of train. Uh, what comes with the, the lack of train and the cut of time, it's the commercial speed, how, how long you, it takes you to go to, from A to B, uh, it's, uh, of course, uh, one of the factors that can uh, influence the, the, the choice of mode. Um, we have seen also a lot of problems uh, on the isolated wagons. You don't have always the, 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 uh, the load to, uh, to, um, to go on a on block train. So we, we have to manage the, uh, the, uh, the fragmentation of, of the demand and make sure that uh, um, isolated wagons are can be managed or that you provide a solution to go from the origin of the, the plant or the distribution center to the next hub where you can load uh, your, your freight on, on the train. The rigidity of the solution also, uh, often we have to book in advance and where the demand is very volatile, in case of no show, you have to pay in full. So it means that uh, you have to make sure, to be sure on your side that you will have uh, this load uh, to go on the train. And of course, I would add 
maybe two uh, specific uh, specific um, uh, situations that are related to the French market. <laughs> I will talk of strikes. Uh, yeah, I have two, and and the quality doesn't has not been there in the in the past years. And at the same time, uh, tracking had some competitive advantages, um, uh, excellent road network, uh, and uh, tracking doesn't pay for negative externalities. So I think that uh, if we want to develop uh, the, the model share of, of train, we have to uh, work on these uh, negative uh, competitive disadvantages and also uh, to work on the competitive advantages to, 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 of the, the tracking to go closer to, to that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Philippe de Carnet. Uh, last but not least on my speaker list of, for this particular question is Christoph Klose, and you are the head of Yard Solutions at Siemens. You heard the previous speaker, you heard my question. In terms of the agility, Anything that comes to your mind, how we could boost rail freight? Yes, thank you very much and um, very well. Good morning also from my side here. Um, we as Siemens, we are a manufacturer and as you have already said, um, we are, my, my responsibility is mainly in the area of infrastructure, means uh, yard solutions. Um, and um, what we have heard before and um, is that flexibility is desperately needed to attract more traffic. And um, if we look what has happened in the past, and I think um, my previous speaker also mentioned this before, um, we have reduced over the time uh, the single wagon transport. More and more went in block trains and shunting yards had been closed or reduced. And um, it's fully understandable because um, there are a lot of reliability issues, they're losing a lot of time, but it was also a complicated process to reassemble trains. And the consequence in the past had been the number of wagons and single wagon transport went down and down and down. Um, but if we're looking into the demand of the future, having more flexibility, requiring more reliability, smaller quantities have to be transported mass goods like coal maybe will be reduced in the future. So we definitely have to work together to make this, the system more flexible and especially shunting more flexible that you can reassemble trains, but also multimodality is, an, is a key topic for that. So that the interchange between the different modes goes more seamlessly. Um, and uh, therefore it's a, it's a critical and crucial importance that we work in this area because um, we also have to understand that the uh, rail as such is a very efficient transport mode, but we always have to manage the rare infrastructure, the rare rail, so to speak. And this is something we have to do very carefully and very interconnected. So uh, this is something we have to work on in the future. And I'm very happy that we have this shift to rail program where we have done a lot but also looking very much forward to the success of program of shift to rail, because a lot of has to be done. Um, and I'm pretty, pretty sure that if the sector stays together and tackle the topics together, uh, that we can make it and that we can uh, get to the market share we would like to have. And 30 by 30 is a very good target, and I fully support that. Thank you very much for this first round. Carlo, you have an announcement. Yes, I would like to remind everyone that uh, they can join and ask questions via Slido, S2R, in of days. You can connect there and you can introduce your question. Uh, and we have a question if you want to, to ask to the panelists. Uh, the question is about why nobody has yet had mentioned combined transport as solution for enhancing the rail freight market share. I don't know who would like to answer it. Combined transport as the solution, or single wagon load, it was also already mentioned. Clements. Clements? 
Well, I didn't single out uh, combined transport for me because for me it's one one part of our product portfolio, right? So essentially, our whole business unit logic is about industry sector and then and then combined transport. So that that is natural. I mean, I know it hasn't been always like that, but I think by now for all all major uh, railway undertakings, um, addressing combined transport the way we address conventional volumes, I think that's standard. What I want to pick up maybe is 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 the topic about uh, about single wagon load and multimodality, which which has been raised a couple of times and then also by you, Carlo. Um, um, I sort of fully agree that the ability to send not just block trains, but to send single wagons um, or groups of wagons is really key to increase modal share, right? Because at least in a in a pre-COVID macro trend, Europe is deindustrializing. So the number of customers and clients who have enough substrates to really fill a full train um, is at least not growing, right? So there are no new smelters, there are no new refineries, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so with that, um, the ability to really offer a customer a single wagon, be it with a truck first, last mile or not, but to offer them just as a single shipment um, is really key. Single wagon is definitely the backbone to offer that. Um, however, we um, strongly believe that um, also to, 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 to address Philippe's point in terms of, of transport speed, right? Single wagon load um, is not the right answer if you talk especially about long distances, right? Because a single wagon load typically goes from Chantignard to Chantignard to Chantignard, um, which takes time because typically you spend eight hours plus in a Chantignard. So, so we very much believe in having a single wagon load infrastructure, especially what well, uh, referring to first and last mile, but then having also shuttle trains between the economic centers, um, which, uh, for example, in our case, go between between the center of Austria and the Rhine Ruhr area, right? So we have a daily connection, and that really allows us to also compete with trucking um, in terms of, of runtime. So yes, single wagon load, but not just the classic single wagon load um, system we've been talking about, but single wagon load augmented with direct shuttle trains between economic centers. Thank you very much. Um, Sergio Barborino, you're really a logistics expert and you haven't spoken yet. What is the customer need and how can rail, rail providers, rail stakeholders answer these customers' needs? And if you want to comment on, on container or single wagon load, please feel free as well. No, no, absolutely. I mean, actually, it's very simple. The, the customers need loads to be transferred point to point. So I don't care about single wagons as a customer. I care that my load is transferred. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> Geodis, for example, found for Procter & Gamble a solution in which they were using wagons. But in the end, they took responsibility for that. It was not our problem to transport in the wagon. They came pick up our pallets in our warehouse and, and managed to find a solution to deliver them in this specific case in the south of France from our distribution center in the north. We need, uh, you know, logistics. We don't need the uh, I mean, I, I have a lot of sympathy for all the integration and technical problems behind making rail work in Europe. But if you want to attract customers, you need to understand what the customer wants. And most customers actually in Europe, and more and more, they need to transport less than a train load, less than a wagon load, less even than a truck load. I mean, more and more, we see more and more parcelization of uh, shipments. So we need to find ways to not only work across modality, but also integrate and disintegrate loads so that all these can flow seamlessly throughout a network made of multiple different modes. And I see so still today, we are dominated by rail operators that look for full block trains. I mean, there are not many customers in Europe that can afford to buy a full block train. We need to buy, we, we need to buy transportation for much smaller consignments and we need the logistic intelligence on integrating these together and ship them across the main corridor of transport in Europe. Thank you very much, Sergio. Um, same question I would like to ask perhaps to Norbert, Norbert Karl. Um, the customer's needs, is it really just to transfer from A to B and is all the rest the problem of the providers? 
No, it's not. I mean, uh, it's very simple, and I like Sergio's view. Logistics is key, um, and uh, the, the end customer doesn't really care uh, whether it's uh, it's rail or the truck that brings the pallet or the container um, to its factory. Um, but um, but what we need to um, also make sure is um, the understanding of the customer needs in the first place. Yeah, so customers vary and they are different. Um, a lot of uh, rail operators are still focusing on the block train, um, the full train, where you traditionally earn much more. Yeah, so that's just the case. If you go for single wagon load, we're not talking about a very profitable business. Uh, you also have a difficulty with the distance ratio. You have to go from one yard to another, whereas uh, the road has a better network. All these uh, aspects have been talked about now. But to tackle these challenges, I think first we have to understand the customer needs. Uh, they are the direct involvement and understanding of the customer is key. And so we've done uh, a number of, of workshops and surveys in shift to rail And uh, um, I agree with um, uh, Philip uh, Decana, trucking has many advantages that we see, um, but also the factors uh, has, have been flushed out by shift to rail which uh, Moritz already, Moritz van Schellenberg already mentioned. So yes, reliability, speed, price, flexibility, uh, tracking, those were key demands is the simplicity. I think simplicity is one of the key points which uh, which we really need to um, um, uh, tackle. Yeah, so we want rail freight to be as simple as online shopping in the end. So that must be uh, that must be um, the goal. So a one click shop where you can assign um, your consignment and and you don't you don't uh, actually choose between different vessels. Uh, you just tell your freight forwarder um, uh, or logistics partner, okay. I want this transport in this time slot. And then we as a railways um, community, we have to understand, so what are the, where do we have leverage? Where can we uh, get better in terms of simplicity? Uh, where can we get better in terms of reliability, uh, speed and price? Um, we must say in, in shift rail, and I'm, I'm steering the, the IP5 from the very beginning, the innovation program that deals with freight. Uh, we have uh, started our journey um, to look at asset-based innovation a lot. But here also, I like Clement's first point, uh, as railways, we first have to do our homework and overcome operational issues, start with the harmonization and the processes, uh, the breaking and so on. Because um, even simple things as language, they cause delays. Yeah, you need to trans and transfer one driver um, uh, to the train just because of language. Um, we're, we're now doing tests in the south of uh, uh, Switzerland. And okay, you need a French driver. Um, so, so another another bottleneck you face. We need to deal with those. But then, you, beyond those simple, uh, I would say, homework tasks that we have in the industry, let's look at um, at, big, at some big innovations uh, that can really give us a boost. Um, and uh, that's what we've been doing in in IP5 and Shift Rail. If you like to, I can give you more insights. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think there is uh, some people who would like to have more insights. So. When I give you the floor next, it would be great if you can provide some concrete examples. But I want to put the question again to Philippe de Carnet. You, and to some extent, you have already received the red carpet by Sergio. You have provided the solution. So what is it that Geodis is doing to capture the customer's need? How do you look at this? How, how putting the customer, the client central, will be the solution to boosting rail freight? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Sergio, for this, these nice uh, words. But uh, sometimes we can, sometimes we can't uh, find uh, the right solution uh, using using uh, rail. I think that uh, we have to um, uh, to be cognizant of uh, uh, the operational constraint that we might have. Some corridors are uh, uh, very relevant for uh, the use of rail. Uh, for some destinations, it it will be uh, less convenient because uh, you will have connections. You will have not direct uh, uh, flights. I would say no <laughs> uh, trains to to this um, uh, destination. So uh, we have to be cognizant of that, and we, um, uh, in in some some situations, we operate or we book on block trains, and in in some situations, we will do uh, what is often called fair cam. Uh, so it's uh, just consolidating uh, cargo. It can be at the level of a pallet or even less, 
uh, and and to board on on a train on certain destinations. So it's the kind of things that we um, we, we need to build up with the time, knowing the the demand because we don't have in that case one single client, but it's. Uh, uh, gathering a portfolio of clients that will uh, um, operate regular flows, more or less regular, which is one of the difficulties, but from point A to point B. So what we try to do is to operate on major corridors between major hubs where we can consolidate along the time um, and smooth uh, a demand and, and fill, uh, fill uh, the, the trains or uh, the number of uh, wagons that we have bought to uh, the train operator. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maurits van Schoenberg, in the port, you have several customers. You know your customers, no doubt. Um, what is it that they are looking for to choose rail freight? Uh, <coughs> the the, the situation in the port is, I think, a bit uh, different. Of large volumes, especially of, uh, of containers, going to the European hinterland. And um, what, what we, we see is that, uh, uh, as said earlier by the other panelists, it's more complex to uh, organize transport by, by rail. And it uh, would be very helpful if it was just as simple as calling a, a trucking company and say, I want to have my container from A to B. But it's, it's a bit more and more complex. And uh, uh, we, we see more and more also uh, economies of Eastern uh, Europe rising, uh, that are distances that are very well uh, suitable for, for real transportation. And uh, still there are uh, lots of trucks going in that, that, that direction. And, and that's... Uh, uh, that, that that should not be the, the case, and so if the, the rail uh, operators, uh, the railway undertakings, and infrastructure managers could uh, work better to, to, to together, uh, lower the, the, the price, uh, assure a better re reliability, there's a huge potential on, on long distances. So that's also why uh, what are we as a support authority invested quite a lot of. Uh, uh, in the optimization of the, the, the train handling in, in our port itself. Now also uh, in the, uh, the rail freight corridors uh, active to, to smooth it out the, the rail transport. Uh, interoperability is all, uh, already mentioned. I think that is one of the, the important things. 740 meter trains, there's still a lot of investment uh, has to be done on the rail freight corridors. Uh, recent research uh, showed that it will bring down that the cost per TU per container uh, with some eight uh, percent. Uh, that, that that helps. So there a lot can can be done, but it's, uh, it's not to be going by by itself. Mm -hmm. Thank May you very I much. intervene with some slide of questions because we have some audience uh, question, and maybe we can ask to the panel uh, to, to answer them. The first one, maybe Sergio, uh, I can bring you back, uh, is about, uh, um, we hear a lot of passengers talking about mobility as a service. What about in freight, logistic as a service? Uh, and you spoke about integration of the overall demand management. Do we need to change business model? And if I uh, take the, the intervention that happened now, uh, I heard the, volume, the question volume uh, from uh, uh, the port of Rotterdam, and uh, uh, I heard the question of uh, agile approach and business model uh, and uh, bringing together the flows by Geodis. So uh, do you have any views from this point of view? Sergio. Well, let me let me answer with something I say. Uh, that I hope nobody takes offense here, but if I go to a butcher shop, I normally order steaks. And if the butcher offers me to buy the full cow, I'm not going to be a happy customer. And that's exactly how it feels today when it comes to railways. You cannot buy, you know, moving a pallet from A to B from uh, the, the type of railway offer that we have today. You need 
the real thing is that you are still stuck with the, you need to buy a full block train and we need to in the rail sector learn the butcher art of cutting the train in pieces and selling it go to market with a much more granular offer to all kind of customers and yes there are big customers like us that buys loads of trucks right and we do a lot of intermodal because we manage to find with some good logistic partners the way of integrating the service so that you can have a full intermodal operation in which to the manufacturing plan that sends the goods out is seamless with normal road transport but the reality is that the vast majority of kilometers of that load will be run on rail and let me under, underline another point it's very important for ports to have good rail connections. We see the growth, for example, in Italy of the port of Trieste, thanks to the big rail connection that we have to the rest of Europe. But the vast majority of transport in Europe is intercontinental, intracontinental. It's not coming from the ports, it's coming. We still do a lot of manufacturing in Europe and we need to distribute manufacture product in Europe from Europe to its consumers. By the way, this is a great economic model in which we do not depend from goods made abroad. We are still very much a manufacturing continent. We want to keep it that way. So we need to address the needs of transportation of people that produce and distribute in Europe. Sergio, you were anticipating on my next question, which was precisely intermodality and the importance of, for rail freight to be well connected to ports. Now we have inland waterway ports, we have even dry ports, and we have sea ports, but they are our gateways in a way to the world. So, Clemens. How important is it to be connected to ports? And you're not an Austrian company, you're an international company. And it's extremely important to be connected to ports, but let me pick up first at, at the multimodality topic, right? Because the whole multimodality argument addresses the same issue I was discussing before, right? So um, also, as Sergio says, the number of customers who really want a block train, right? is definitely going down and then he goes even further saying most customers just want a pallet or a parcel, right? But um, the further you go away from industrial customers, the less is the chance that the customer has a customer siding where you can really deliver it, a, a wagon, for example. So essentially multimodality in all its aspects is really, really key. Yeah, um, and that, that affects uh, rail and truck. Um, and that affects definitely also rail and, and waterway. So, I mean, um, going to the seaports, that's definitely something essentially all the big rail operators are doing. There are significant networks. And I think some trend is now also going towards inland waterways. We're, for example, now um, currently strongly cooperating with the port of Duisburg, Duisport, um, and using their tri-modal port um, really as a gateway towards the, the, the Sahara ports and then, and then back into Central Europe. So, so um, inland waterways, I would say in terms of, 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 of current relevance, definitely below um, um, seaports and, and, and below trucking, but that's also something which is really coming up. And, and while, I have the, while I have a chance to, to talk, as, as long as, as you don't interrupt me, I think it's also extremely important in our discussion here because I think we keep oscillating between between two, two layers, right, of, of service. The, the first one is really rail and rail freight being the backbone, the logistics backbone, also as the commission has been saying, right? And there, um, all the things that, 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 that um, for example, I and, and, and Norbert and others were focusing about, how can we make this backbone more efficient, more reliable, um, um, more competitive, right? And then there is a second layer, which I would refer to as the logistics layer. And logistics layer really means how do I provide services for a customer like Sergio, right, um, who has a functional need of sending one pallet using that backbone? I think we, we, we need to be able to, to, or we need to, 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 to differentiate because it's two levels of challenges we're having. Mm -hmm. Just to say to my panelists, I can see all of you simultaneously in the screen. You don't have to wait that I address you a question. If you really want to intervene, just wave and I'll write it down immediately. I wanted to come back still to Christoph Klose with that question as well on intermodality, multimodality. What is it the customers are looking for? 
Um, yes. Um, the point is, and um, uh, what, what Clemens has said is also the view I, I would support. Um, we, the rail is the backbone and there will be, and in most cases, there have to be, uh, let's say another mode of transport um, afterwards or before, because um, as said, not all sites have a direct rail access and the quantities they are shipping also make it not necessary to have a rail access. So that made that, that the connection between these two levels and these two modes become crucial important. Um, that we not see this only as a, comp as a competition, we could also see this as complementary in, in this regard. And therefore we have to look for solutions to linking these in a better way together, that we have that the terminals are made in a way that they, that they are easy accessible also from the, from the roadside, but um, also that uh, these are, let's say, not, let's say, too rare to, so to speak, that the trucks have to go hundreds of kilometers before they reach a, a suitable uh, rail connection. Um, <clears throat> and therefore, this, this inter, this, this uh, let's say, a, a close geographical um, proximity is a, is a point, but also then a good interconnection also on the data level, so that the systems are very well interlinked and uh, so that the, also the exchange between information between the rail and the road and also on the other side, the waterways could be ensured. And therefore this, let's say interconnection, not only the physical and geographical, but also the interconnection on the data side, it's a very important, um, in, let's say prerequisite uh, to make this more attractive and more efficient. Thank you very much. Also, uh, providing very nicely a keyword for my next question, digitalization and this data layer. How do you think that this will influence and, of course, help over the next coming years that fast rail integration into the whole system happens, that the reliability improves, um, the intermodality as well. I'd like to start with Norbert, because definitely there are some things that you have already been working on in the current shift to rail, but I'm really interested to look into the five to seven next years. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, we've, we've talked a lot about um, logistics and the logistics layer, but also if we look at the railway layer and the asset management, um, we can make use of data a lot. Um, so uh, we've started our condition-based maintenance program in, in, inside shift to rail uh, more or less uh, four years back. And um, we started just collecting what we have as data of our assets um, using our fleet as uh, real-time data generators. And now we have 1,400 locos in our analytics cluster and we've also uh, rolled out Wagon Intelligence. And we can see that the data you obtain there um, serves a growing number of use cases. So that must be taken into account. Uh, we do have something at our hands here with it, which is really uh, worth a lot uh, and the worth is growing. The more you integrate in the digital age, uh, the more, um, the more uh, your products are worth. And uh, so we have to open up and that's one of the key challenges and exchange about the learnings that we generate uh, from our data analytics, learnings like uh, when components when components will fail in the field, uh, how we can uh, minimize uh, the the LCC cost, um, uh, just because we don't send um, some local to the workshop uh, when it's actually still working, uh, and because we prevent failures before they actually happen. Uh, so those are uh, things we do in condition-based maintenance. But you could go farther, I think, in the next step in the next years ahead. Uh, to exchange this knowledge base with other operators, um, also more with manufacturers, uh, to improve on one hand the product development. We don't know much about uh, the, the product once we get a local delivered. Uh, we don't know uh, its behavior. We have to find that out. Um, so there's definitely a benefit for us, but the benefit for the OEM would be, oh, I see in the long, in the long term uh, how the behavior is. Uh, I can, I can uh, benefit in my uh, product development and consider that. Uh, so there's a lot uh, of learning in that exchange. Of course, learning between uh, different uh, railway undertakings. We also must exchange on how do we work uh, with a very international, a very uh, heterogeneous uh, fleet. 
Uh, so just, just like Clemens, we're also active in a number of European countries, yeah, running 3,000 uh, trains a day. And, uh, and there are, of course, challenges how to uh, operate that. We have a central element of our IP5 vision, which is the asset control tower. And there we don't just talk about condition-based maintenance, but about condition-based operations. So really operational decisions need to be based um, on, on the live data that we have available. And that's just one example going in the CBM side of things, but you can also look at um, the automation in the network where you need to integrate more and make use of um, the integration of the traffic management system and of the data that you have as a fleet operator. So also there's um, a lot of music in that uh, if you look at the potential of automation. Um, and because I, I will just take the opportunity here to say there is some, some key elements we've been tackling um, already in shift rail in IP5, where we need to conse consequently continue. Um, and, and these are, of course, a part of the digital journey that you asked for, uh, but it's, it's not always separated from, from the hardware that we work with. Uh, so for instance, um, uh, Clemens mentioned the digital automatic coupler in, in the beginning. Yeah, so this is, this is one of the innovations uh, that we can use from a logistics perspective uh, to reduce yard time, uh, to increase throughputs, uh, uh, but, but also at the same time, this will enable digitization automation. Uh, so there's a dual focus of this innovation, very important. Um, if we look at uh, things like uh, the intelligent video gate, which we have uh, tested in shift to rail um, this is also something, it's a piece of hardware that monitors uh, your train and the condition of your wagons in order to give you information about uh, maintenance decision. But um, it's, of course, uh, also important to integrate in the intermodal business, and you can use it in ports just as well um, to improve your data handling uh, when a train uh, gets loaded in a port uh, and you, you automatically want to um, uh, raise the quantities of trains going out of that port. So these video gates also have a dual purpose, also in the digitization um, side of things. So there are a number of innovations which are, I think, uh, quite encompassing, quite large. Um, and, and we need to make sure when we talk about digitization, we're not just about apps, we're not just about um, um, some of the, uh, the smaller and uh, faster things, but there are some um, very operational, very uh, safety relevant innovations um, that have a, a digital uh, domain to them. Uh, and we need to follow up with that. Thank you very much. You put quite a lot of emphasis on, on digitalization as a means to, let's say, reduce costs and increase the capacity. Um, I also see an enormous potential of linking it better, and, and you refer to the traffic management, but to work on the flexibility and predictability thanks to the data. I was wondering, um, if uh, perhaps Philippe de Carnet, you had a, a view on how digitization work that could be done in the future joint undertaking might help you. Um, thank you for the question. I'm not sure that I have a clear view on, on that. Um, the only part uh, where I, th I see um, Possibilities is the, the, the connection, yes, of course, of uh, uh, data uh, status uh, data coming uh, from uh, from the train operators, like we do with uh, with the uh, air and ocean freight. Uh, we we need to know where is the the cargo, um, how um, the the quality is delivered. But but I'm I'm not sure that for us it's it's a key uh, moving forward in terms of the rail development. But I think Sergio has a strong view on digitization automation. <laughs> no, 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 not so strong, but I see a question in the slide though, about data access and sharing competitive data. Now, the reality is that, I mean, I've been working quite a lot on the European initiative of the Digital Transport and Logistics Forum, and there are two active projects today, Phoenix and Federated. And what these projects are trying to do is to create the data standard that will allow easy interchange of data. The problem is not about making public competitive data, but today, 
with the supply chains that we manage, just integrating data from one provider to the other, when people want to share the data, most of the time, all you get is an email or at best an Excel spreadsheet. I mean, honestly, this is not enough. We should be able to do better than that. I have all the sympathy in the world for not making your data completely public, but it should be possible between uh, customers and, and supplier to exchange data seamlessly. And we need to move in that direction. I mean, if we want to have a seamless logistic system, as we call it a physical internet in which everything flows seamlessly, you need to have standardization, both in the physical world, right? The bag on the load, the pallet, the box, but also in data exchange standards so that it's going to be plug and play all the time, every time you try to build a new innovative supply chain. I want to, to move on a bit uh, on digitization automation, and of course we can come back on this. Um, for us in Europe, in EU institutions, we are about to start a new financial framework period. We will start with money to be programmed and to be spent. There will be money on research and innovation, and there will be money on infrastructure, which is hard infrastructure as well as soft infrastructure. I'd like to put the question to all of you. Where do you think the money should go as a priority? And you each have two choices, because if I get everything from everyone, it won't really help for the prioritization. Clemens, can you make a start? Um, two is a tough choice. So there's a clear number of one, which is digital automatic coupling. I think that's, that's really a game changer. Um, and then following, following today's discussion, I would go point number two is digital platforms. Digital platforms. Thank you very much. I'll go around with the question. So uh, can I put it next um, to Maurits van Schoelenburg? Where should the money go? Um, I think in the, the, the digitization of the processes, a lot can, can be, be gained. There's still a quite old-fashioned way of working in, in the real business. And um, we also invested quite a lot in, in the digitization. Um, we're now also working on plans for the collaborative the, the decision-making from Troll Tower, as mentioned uh, also by other panelists, and uh, lots of Efficiency can, can be uh, derived from, from that, so, so that, that, that would be the number one. But also hard infrastructure is, is needed. Uh, the, with, uh, both in the freight, but also in the passenger uh, railway sector, there are huge ambitions. And there will be capacity issues on, on certain uh, tracks. So it's, it's very good to also, next to the, the digitization, also invest in purely the hard uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Christoph Klose, how yes, can uh, you help us prioritize programming yeah. of money? <laughs> um, I very tend to agree what, what Clemens have said uh, before, because the clear number one is a digital automatic coupler. Is, this is something where we have to introduce this now. Um, to overcome one of the largest disadvantages uh, of the system with a lot of manual work and especially time-consuming work. But for me, it's pretty important that we are not focusing only on the coupler. The digital aspect is also very important it's because in the, in the past years, a lot of focus and emphasis have been uh, put on the coupler itself, on the mechanics. And now it's very, very crucial that we keep up also with the um, digital part. So with all the use cases um, we have identified already, that they become implemented um, also at the same time because they are de really delivering the benefits. And therefore, this is for me a very crucial topic uh, and for me absolutely the point number one. Uh, the point number two, um, I would say we have to also increase the, the level of automation going also on, on the infrastructure side to it. And I would like to put the, the target uh, here on, on, this, on the stage, on the table, to say why we should not strive for a fully automated shunting operation. Um, this is now done in a lot of logistics centers. Everybody in the logistics center looking for fully automated operation in the logistics center. And this is something we also have to strive for in the rail sector, 
that this at the moment highly manual time consuming process are really go to full automation. I know that this is nothing what could be achieved in five years. But today it's a very important and the next years, especially under the next uh, shift to rail successor program to go into this direction to also sit this as a target and to work to it. Thank you. I don't know if you can see us, but Carlo and me, we were just nodding, listening to you here already. Philippe de Carnet, if you were to advise us on programming the money, where would it make most business sense from Geodi's point of view? Uh, as I told you, I'm not sure that uh, digitalization for me, on my point of view, of course, is, uh, is the key uh, as of today, uh, because we, we think that we have built systems to, uh, to share information seamlessly between uh, our customers and ourselves, but maybe on the interaction between the, the, the rail operator and us, it would be, it would be good to uh, invest a little bit. But where I see the, the, mo the, the most important needs is uh, first on the agility, the efficiency that has been mentioned by, uh, by, by the previous panelists, and also uh, infrastructure, because I see that we have a lack of, lot, lack of capacity, sorry, uh, on some corridors where the, uh, the, the rail, the freight is competing on rail with passengers. And uh, it's the reason why we have uh, not enough trains or not enough frequency. And uh, this is for me uh, a, a real concern because if we want to develop uh, rail, we need this capacity. Yes, thank you very much. I'm actually surprised how little we've been talking about the ERTMS and the SIPMED traffic management um, in terms of creating capacity as well. Norbert, if you were to continue in your function, where should we put the money? Right. So um, one popular topic, and I just have to support this, yeah, yeah is the digital automatic coupling. So um, yes, it is it's an extreme disadvantage. It's time consuming. So standardization, certification, rollout, we need this solution in order uh, to be more competitive um, in the long run. And it's a huge challenge. It's a European topic, which only shift to rail can solve. That's my, my, my clear statement. If we don't do it here, nobody uh, will do this. So the duck delivery program is, is the right step. Um, the second point, and, and uh, there I pick up what you say, I'm not, I'm not um, so keen about ERTMS by itself, but let's talk about automation, yeah, and the, uh, the corridor automation uh, with a real growth impact. Uh, I see that the growth comes from, uh, from the harbors. We have our West Port strategy, uh, Clemens mentioned the Zara ports. Uh, so, so I think currently um, the Zara ports are below 50% that goes, uh, that goes to the railways, um, um, much lower partially. Um, and we need to absorb the growth that will come in in the next years. These are growing ports. Um, so, so I would say corridor automation uh, with a focus on, on the harbors and the Hafen Hinterlandverkehr, so the transport from harbors to yards, yard automation and the automation down the stretch um, on the corridor. And if I could give you a prime example, I would just promote Rail Freight Corridor 1, uh, where we see the Zara ports volumes growing uh, a Kaifuk uh, as a shunting yard, um, which absorbs this growth or will have to do it. And we have a dedicated freight line uh, then starting the stretch of the corridor, which is the Bituva line. And this stretch uh, would in my eyes be the, be the perfect platform uh, to promote such a thing um, as automated train operation ATO over ETCS. And maybe also um, with the flexibility um, of automation systems, which are ETCS independent, because we will also need those uh, in order to serve our customers' needs, as we have discussed. Thank you very much. Um, very energetic. Maurits, you'll give me a sign if you need to react um, which ports uh, competition is being developed here under this. Um, I don't know if you want to react at this moment in time. I felt it was a bit of a challenge also. No, I, I, I fully agree with, with, with Norbert. Uh, volumes from the, 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 the ports, uh, west ports, are, are growing. This year is, of course, a, a very special year, but still the, the freight trains are, are doing uh, quite well. And uh, there, there are lots of ways to, to optimize uh, it. And uh, uh, automated uh, train operation could, could be one of it. And uh, also the, the, the digital uh, coupling, automated coupling, 
uh, th those innovations are, are very important to, to get uh, the real freight business uh, up in the, the 21st century uh, with the digitization and automation. When you look at the, the seaside, for instance, uh, uh, our container terminals are almost fully automated. And if you then if you compare the, the, the real business, and there's a long way to, to go. Thank you very much. So to close this round for that question, Sergio, how would yes, you dispose you. of the money? I, can you, yeah, so I just wanted to underline the fact that, yes, I mean, I would prioritize automation. I mean, I agree with Philippe that we have bottlenecks, but those bottlenecks in Europe have been pretty much addressed, right? I mean, but it will take time to get that infrastructure to fruition. While automation can create capacity, give you an example, the Euro tunnel. Yes, you can, as a passenger is an amazing service, but it was built to have 100 freight trains overnight. Now think what that could do to Brexit, right? And they've always be, stay below uh, uh, on single digits. I mean, less than 10% capacity utilization. Why? Because there are all kinds of annual operations that need to happen in the shunting yard in Calais. So we, put, for example, put the train through the Euro tunnel, we had to stop because, because of all this manual uh, uh, operation before entering the tunnel, the train had to stop. So all of a sudden the UK authorities were afraid of migrants, that the, um, the, the terminal was not secure and they killed our operation. If it would be an automated operation with the train never stopping, that would not be a problem. So automation is absolutely a priority. Thank you very much. I don't know if there's anything from the well, audience. Yeah, there are some questions that, uh, uh, a couple of questions from Slido that we can follow up. Uh, the first one is uh, rail has several advantages for bulk transport. Are you ready to innovate and grasp more markets, Amazon one day delivery, food, refrigerated goods? I think also the digital automated coupler from this point of view will be a, an opportunity, but and, maybe the panelists. What about high speed rail freight? Exactly. Sergio, go ahead, please. Well, in Italy, in Italy, they actually did uh, uh, open a uh, connection between Bologna and Marcianese near Napoli with a nice speed train for parcel delivery, mainly driven by Amazon distribution. Now, of course, the asset was completely, you know, not fit for it. So they had to go through very narrow doors. They had to develop very strange dollies. I mean, again, in logistics, standardization matters. Despite that, um, they found more effective to do it this way, but eventually I think they will build just a distribution center in the south of Italy. I mean, I mean uh, to me, it's a bit overblown, but it shows that it is possible. It's absolutely possible to have this kind of solutions. And it's also a question of using capacity, of course, on yeah. high speed lines. Right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have about 15 minutes left for this session. Um, for me, the important debate is to be able to conclude together with Carlo on a few ideas for the programming of the future shift to rail, future rail joint undertaking. I got a lot of ideas already now when we had this question on where to put the money. Many of them come back to digitization automation. I'm not surprised, but I'd like to give you once again, the opportunity um, for expressing your wish of what you would like to see as part of Shift to Rail's work program for the first two years. And um, if, you, if you feel that you already expressed exactly what you would like to f see there under the previous question, just underline it once again. But this is now not infrastructure, this is clearly what is in the remit of the joint undertaking. And I see Clemens has already made a sign. Sorry, um, now I'm muted. Um, so if I can name a third one, right? I think the third one on my list would be digital capacity management. Because it, it's, it again addresses the points that, that have been raised by, by Philips and others about the flexibility, about the, the, the speed at which we as a railway sector can react to, to, to changes in volumes, to changes in, in trade lanes and so on. 
and, and to get a reliable train path um, internationally, right? Takes you quarters to, to three quarters of a year, right? If you don't wanna, wanna, wanna just run on an ad hoc uh, path, which then don't satisfy the quality requirements of, of our customers. So I think um, going towards digital capacity management, I think DBNets um, has done a very good first step here along the corridors which really allows you most likely along predefined paths for rail freight to say, okay, I now want to go from, let's say, Rotterdam to, to Vienna. Um, and within minutes, um, you get a train pass. Um, that would be a real innovation, which would allow us um, to be much more flexible also as a sector, right? And then if you then combine it also with coupling ETCS and so on, with stack ETCS and so on, ETCS 3, then you also get the capacity you need. So I think that's, that would be really a, a key a key game changer for us as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Christoph wanted to intervene. Yeah. Christoph. Christoph first and then Philip next, please. Okay. So um, yeah, um, I think uh, what 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 uh, Clement has mentioned as his second priority that was this data platform and this data exchange. And um, for me. Um, we are a sharing economy. So we sharing the network, we sharing our assets. Freight wagons going will be operated in a train from our operator A to operator B. But this also in the future means the data have to go with it. So what does it help if we digitize a freight wagon with generating all kinds of data, but the data stays somewhere maybe with the wagon owner and not be transferred to the operator. So I would think that uh, a work have to be done that not making all data transparent, that's clear, but making necessary data transparent and available that they are not stucking somewhere and we not make the sector is not making use of these data and delivered advantages it can be delivered with this. And I think this is not so much an investment priority, it's maybe really a priority to work on the standards and the formats, how to handle that. Thank you very much. Philip, then next, please. Yeah, just maybe I'm jumping to the, the conclusion, but I, I, I want just to take this opportunity to say that I'm very happy uh, from this discussion this morning because I was prepared to have uh, uh, people from uh, rail and uh, from logistics in two different worlds, not talking and not understanding each other. And I'm, I'm very surprised to, to be honest and, and very happy to, uh, to see that uh, among the panelists, at least we are all on the same page, have the same understanding and the same understanding also of what uh, should be done to uh, improve uh, and to increase uh, the, the, the share of uh, rail modality. So just to say that I'm, I'm happy of this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you're all happy that you participated in the panel and um, you are already starting to conclude, but I would like to have um, other panelists as well, the opportunity um, to tell us, I, I see Norbert raising his hand and also Sergio, of course, no, but go ahead, please. Okay. Yeah, the programming for about... shift to rail and your conclusions from the panel. Right, right. Um, so, so just because you also asked about the next two years and I, I was thinking, um, okay, with the DAC um, digital automatic coupler, we might be there and we might find uh, the right uh, solutions uh, in, the, in the next testing coming up um, to be fast with a, with a rollout. But the next two years, really, uh, there must be a focus um, on, on architecture in terms of how digitization and how automation will play out. Um, so what we always see is that there are um, isolated um, uh, islands, I would almost say, of, of, of engineers developing something like an ATO module, which for them is automation. Uh, but that's not automation. That's just an autopilot that works on a main line and, and, and maybe only on ETCS. Uh, then we have other elements, uh, people looking at automated brake testing, uh, people looking at yards. Um, I think you need some sort of a system integration view and you need to start that in the beginning uh, so that you look at the automated system um, overall. How can the digitization and automation play together? How can I use the data that I have available for my CBM and analytics? How can that uh, be of help in troubleshooting when I have automated lines and, and want to um, uh, clear the lines fast? So um, that has to be looked into uh, first. So I, I would say 
Um, and I'm picking up here from Keir Fitch, who mentioned yesterday that you need a robust uh, um, and open uh, reference architecture uh, that has to be uh, defined uh, to some degree that when we bring in a new technology and there will be many new technologies in the field of digitization automation that we don't have to test this uh, new module against uh, any given uh, configuration in the field but that we can say okay this is our reference this is our test bench this is uh, where we uh, where we quickly um, achieve a green light in order to roll out um, um, innovations to the field mm. Thank you very much. I think you touched on a very important point there, and it's one of our priorities as well, that we want to be much, much faster to bring the innovation from its development phase into its market phase. And I think that's one of the lessons we have learned as well from, from the work until now. Um, Sergio, please. Yes, I just wanted to say, but we had the long discussions with uh, Carlo Borghidi now for months, that it would be nice for the next shift to rail uh, program to include a bit of business model innovation, go to market innovation in the program that could then include some of the customers uh, in, in, the, in the strategy. It's not an expensive investment, but it's an important investment in order to increase the impact. Thank you. Fits perfectly. We have this idea of a system pillar under the future joint undertaking where we can discuss how the different bits of innovation will come together and form a whole, how this whole can be moving fast towards innovation without burden some readjustment and interoperability issues, how we can be very close to the market. I think that's one of our ideas as well that we want to put into the legal basis that um, in the calls, the, the um, business aspect should be part of the evaluation as well because we really want to have a change coming very, very quickly. Um, I don't know who else would like to take floor for some final words. For me, it has also been an extremely interesting discussion. I take away uh, the question of the agility, the flexibility, which is linked, of course, with reducing cutoff times. Several mentions also of technology that can reduce the costs, yeah. increase the affordability that's linked to the data analytics. I think also the couplers would come in here as well. We want to also look at automation of shunting. I think that plays both into agility in terms of being able to move faster and in terms of cutting the cost. And then, of course, Rail cannot do without abbreviations, but ATO over ETSC <laughs> is one of the things that we will definitely want to do. And I would also like to really thank you for, for this positive and cooperative discussion where, in fact, I didn't see any contradictions at all. We, we come very close together with our joint vision. And that's why, having appreciated also discussing the obstacles, I'd like to conclude on the note that when we have the European Year of Rail coming up here, we should not talk only about all the difficulties, all the things that remain as obstacles. We should talk about what we can do, what we can achieve, and if we can manage for rail freight, the multimodality, the Europeanization, the performance, then for sure we can manage for Europe in rail to be part of European mobility. Carlo, I'm sure you also draw some hopefully very positive conclusions yes, from this before I would before like to call Indra also on board because uh, we can complement uh, the final uh, point. Yes. Uh, for me, the, one of the key points of the panelists that maybe we didn't tell them, but I think and I hope they will be able to join us in this work because especially uh, the ports, as was mentioned, I think are key components, as Sergio said, uh, the participation of, of the uh, logistic value chain uh, will be an, an important element to, to engage in the discussion to bring it forward. Well, Indra. What a positive message this was. It was really a positive discussion for me. My ta key takeaways are that rail freight is really the backbone of lo logistics, but also that automation, intermodality, and digitalization is key to move forward. And last but not least, I particularly like this image of simplicity. So rail freight should be as simple as shopping for the client. Thank you very much, Liz.
but thank you, Carlo. Thank you, all the participants as well. And in the meantime, dear audience, we hear that the parallel sessions with Esther and Sebastian are also going very well. If you are interested but don't want to leave us here, don't worry, as all the parallel sessions are being recorded and will be made available after the event, so you can catch up with them later. For now, it's coffee o'clock. Enjoy stretching your legs. The next session will be starting at 11 sharp. See you then.